Here's to whiskey kisses, the peachy taste of sin. Good evening, whiskey folk, and welcome back once again to my kitchen here in sunny British Columbia. Um, very sunny, actually. As you might be able to see, I got sunburnt this afternoon. I didn't realise it was possible when it was only 12 degrees out. Who knew? Um, but yes, welcome to another episode of Drinking Out Loud. I am, as ever, your host, Adam Bradshaw, and today we're talking Japanese whiskey. Um, and where better to start with an opening dram than a long morn? And some of you are already getting the inside joke on this. Long morn's not Japanese. You've probably realised this. Long morn's very Scottish. However, the uh, unequivocal godfather of Japanese whiskey, Masataka Takatsuru, studied for a while at Longmorn. Longmorn was one of his inspirations um, in distilling. Um, Longmorn was actually the blueprint of his stills when he set up his first distillery up in Hokkaido. Uh, so, big link between Longmorn and Japanese whiskey. So, let's give this a try. Uh, yep, this is honestly a near-perfect warm-up dram. Um, it's got a lot of character to it. It's, it's I believe, a mix of uh, sherry and bourbon, if I remember correctly. Yep, American oak hair, American oak barrels and hogsets. Mm. You know, I would I would bet a relatively significant amount of, amount of money that some of those hogsets are at sherry because it's definitely got a lot of sherry notes on this. Even the official tasting notes say, you know, the orange marmalade kind of uh, nutty. Yeah, I, I, I would bet there's probably some, some sherry oak in this. Anyway, this is a very interesting bottle because much like the Capadonic that was in the last video, this is not meant to be here. Um, this is actually part of the exact same series as that Capadonic, a series that is only supposed to be in airports. This is another one which is cheaper up here at the Strath than it is at the airport where it's meant to be. Um, and it's even cheaper now that it is on uh, special. This is another one that we had in the Dram Association just before um, the outbreak happened. In fact, you might notice there's very little left. This is actually um, th this this is actually some of the leftover from that Dram, um, mm -hmm. from the Dram Association tastings in store. Um, and yeah, it's 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 stunning. It's beautiful. I, I like it a lot. Uh, especially because it's an official bottling 18-year-old single malt. It's 48%, so that's that's great off the bat. Non-chill filtered. It doesn't specifically say non-coloured, but I don't know. As I said before, I don't really care that much. Um, individually bottle numbered, which is kind of cool. This is bottle number 63,239. Um, but yeah, just a really cool small batch edition, 18-year-old Longmore. And this is available right now on strathlicker.com for only $130.35. That is effing ridiculous. Uh, so I have a full bottle that uh, I was going to open for this video, but I figured I may as well finish off this one because I don't know when we're going to be opening, uh, when we're going to be able to uh, have whiskies again for sampling in the store, but that is going to overdoxidize and taste like crap by the time we reopen, probably. So I don't want to subject you guys to that. So I will take this bullet for you and uh, and finish off this long one. So the normal price is $147.74, so you're getting a pretty decent discount there. $130.35. Yeah, Slash of R is a great warm-up. Yeah, soft fudge is something I, I, I read. I should never read the official tasting notes before I actually drink it because it always, you know, makes me think of those things and it's, it's good to have a blank canvas sometimes when you're going in for a dram. Uh, but yeah, soft fudge is definitely on there. The ripe juice, uh, ripe pear, uh, pear juice, yep, very, very good note. Anyway, it's probably enough about the opening dram. I am going to do something I'm not supposed to do right now and scratch my nose. Oh, that was satisfying. Thank you once again, Sheringham, for providing me this hand sanitizer so that I can scratch my nose safely. Alrighty. And for those of you thinking, you should probably sanitize before you scratch your nose, Adam. Don't worry, I sanitized before this video started. So, 
we are all good. Now, whatever I touch will not have whatever my nose has been touching, which hopefully is just my pillow. Um, and on we go with the show. So, Japanese whiskey. Started with a long one. Let's see where we head next. We have three whiskeys for you today. The final of the trilogy being the brand new release, which I'm very excited to crack open. I haven't tried it at all, so you're going to get my my own personal first impressions right here on camera. Um, but we're going to start off by just talking about what is Japanese whiskey? What makes Japanese whiskey Japanese? And trying to sort of start the conversation, maybe clear the air a little bit about some of the misconceptions about Japanese whiskey these days. So... First of all, I just want to say G whiskey, that's uh, J I G whiskey, is a commonly misunderstood term. It technically just means local whiskey or craft whiskey. So it's it's the equivalent of us calling, you know, Shelter Point or Divine a, a local craft whiskey. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't make it any less whiskey. It doesn't make it any more whiskey. It just means that it's got a certain sort of place to it, right? It's it's got it's it. We like to support local. I think that's that's something throughout the world is something that we all like to try and do. Um, so it, it's it's a it's just a term. Uh, a lot of people think that G whiskey means lesser whiskey, lesser Japanese whiskey, and a lot of people think that it specifically means Jap fake Japanese whiskey, Japanese whiskey which isn't really Japanese at all. And that is something that we'll definitely be getting into here. So. Why would Japanese whiskey be referred to as a fake Japanese whiskey? Well, because Japan has different regulations and laws about their whiskey, just like we have here in Canada, where we have a law in Canada, which no one else in the world has, that says that um, up to 1 11th of your whiskey is allowed to not even be whiskey, and you can still call it Canadian whiskey. If we can get away with that in Canada, I think Japan is allowed a pass on the fact that they allow some international whiskey to be blended with their local whiskey and it's still to be allowed to be called Japanese whiskey. Because in Japan, they realize a very real truth, which I think the rest of the world is hung up on and doesn't really understand, that the distillation, whilst absolutely a very, very important part of the process, is only one part of the process. And really what makes Japanese whiskey is much more the maturation and the blending first and foremost. Like Japanese blending styles to try and get that quintessential Japanese style is huge. And the industry knows this. And that's why we're getting to see things like the uh, the bourbon that was out recently. Um, I, can't, I forget the name of it right now, but it was a, a collaboration between Beam and Centauri, obviously are the same company, Beam Centauri. Um, uh, we have it in the store right now, and it's the idea was that uh, the master uh, blender from Centauri came to the uh, to Jim Beam, took some bourbon, and blended it using Japanese techniques and maturation, and it's awesome. Um, I am really blanking on the name. My memory's been bad these last couple of days. I'm sorry, you're going to have to help me out in the comments. If you can remember, or if you can Google right now, which is something I can't do because I'm on camera, um, take a look for me. Uh, let me know the, the name of, of that whiskey because I'm blanking. Anyway, but yeah, the, the people are, are coming around to the fact that Japanese style whiskey is, is a real thing, despite a lot of it not actually being distilled in Japan. And a lot of people don't realize a lot of the most popular, most well, highly regarded Japanese whiskies most likely aren't even fully made in Japan. Like a lot of people are saying, oh, these new newfangled whiskey G whiskies that we're seeing out here that we've never seen before in the market. Well, they're obviously just trying to trick us all into spending our hard earned money into buying like third rate scotch, which was bottled in Japan. It's just not, it's just not true. I mean, some of it is naturally, I mean, there's always going to be some of that going on, but even Nika, even Nika has a lot of scotch in it. Nika from the barrel, they don't say it, they don't outright admit it, but I would be very surprised if Nika from the barrel wasn't a pretty large percentage of Ben Nevis, which is a distillery in Scotland, which Nika owns. That makes sense to me. That, like, I mean, why wouldn't you? There's nothing wrong with using a high-quality Scottish whiskey or whiskey from somewhere else in the world 
in your blend. So long as you're staying true to the Japanese uh, style, go for it, I say. Um, but we're going to start off with something which no one can argue isn't Japanese, and no one can argue isn't whiskey, um, and that is something that I've grown very fond of since since getting a bottle when it first came out over here, um, and it's, an, it's one of those interesting ones. Um, there's, there's a series of reviews, actually, that you should check out on uh, Aquavitae, the other YouTube channel, uh, with Roy, where he only reviews whiskies once he's finished the bottle, and he actually reviews them as he's throwing the bottle into the recycling bin, which is a fantastic concept. And there's a lot of truth to that. Like, your first impressions of a whiskey are just that, first impressions, and you only get to know a whiskey once you've spent quite a bit of time with it. And now that I've gone through half a bottle of this next whiskey, I have a completely different opinion of it um, than when I started. So... Without further ado, that first whiskey tonight is the White Oak, the Akashi Single Malt. And this is something that, honestly, I got quite early in my time managing the whiskey portfolio at the Strath. Uh, I brought it into the store because I was mostly just excited to see a full single malt from Japan that we could get and that was available. I thought at the time it was a bit overpriced, but honestly... I think Japanese whiskey in general is a slight bit overpriced, um, but this is not. I really don't think it is anymore. Uh, I think this stands up to to its price point. I, I think this is a very well-crafted, well-made whiskey. So what do we got? We've got white oak akashi, single malt whiskey akashi. So I am reading the Japanese as well, akashi. I studied Japanese for a few years. I remember very little, but I can still read Katakana and Hiragana pretty well. So that's this is Hiragana Akashi. Um, and this is actually from what is known here as the White Oak Distillery, um, but in Japan would be known as Egashima, which translates to White Oak. And as you can see, the label is all in Japanese. And as much as I just said, I, I, I did learn the Japanese language uh, for several years in, uh, in high school, I certainly can't read the vast majority of this label. There's a lot of kanji in there that I have never seen before. Um, luckily, we have a little bit of information in English as well on this uh, secondary label. So uh, what does it say here? White Oak Akashi Single Malt Whiskey, 500 ml, product of Japan, 46% alcohol, produced and bottled by uh, Egashima Shuzo Company, imported by TS Global, Vancouver, BC. And I don't think TS Global is the import uh, agent for these guys anymore, which is sad because I absolutely love the uh, the guys at TS Global. Um, yeah, I I think I think they're doing a great job uh, introducing a lot of really interesting Japanese whiskies to us over here. Um, but um, we still have some of this whiskey, and I'm you know I'm, I'm a big fan of the the single malt. So the big word to look for here is single malt, because just like in Scotland and many parts of the world, in Japan, that means that all of this, all of this whiskey has to come from a single distillery. Um, and it does. This this is all from the Egashima distillery. So I'm going to give myself a little glass of this. So Egashima is hilariously old. Like, we talk about the oldest uh, Scotch whiskey distilleries and um, there's a bit of a battle as to which one's got the legitimate claim. Like, I, I'm in the Glen Turret camp. I think they've got a pretty strong claim. 1775 at Glen Turret. Egashima, they started business in 1679. That's almost 100 years before the oldest still functioning Scotch distillery. Um, they weren't distilling back then, of course, no. Um, they were in business in various other ways, um, making various other drinks, I believe, uh, for samurai. That is brilliant. Like, 1679, like, they were making drinks for samurai. That is cool. Um, so they were making sake and shochu. And in 1888, we, we know for certain they were making sake and shochu. We have records for that. Um, and they were actually the very first distillery in all of Japan to get a license to make whiskey in 1919. So that is quite, quite big. Now, rather inexplicably... They didn't act upon that license until 1984. Why it took them that long? I don't know. Maybe they had an idea and then they realized it was harder in practice and they thought it was on paper and just decided to give up. And they didn't just, just took them a while to, to get around to doing, giving it uh, a go again. I, I am not entirely sure, but I'm glad they did. 
And they they started up uh, in the 80s and were very much catering to locals. They were making Japanese whiskey much in, much in the craft sense, same way that sort of Divine are at the moment, catering mostly to locals, but with an eye on quality and with one eye open to the concept of being a bigger player in the future. Um, so they actually only make whiskey for two months a year now, um, which is mad. I mean, they mostly make, make shoju and sake and other, other Japanese style drinks. Um, and of those two months, I believe they only make single malt for a couple of weeks. They make grain whiskey as well. They actually make a, uh, um, a white oak blended whiskey, which looks very similar to this, but a different color label, I believe. Um, I don't like it. Personally, I think it's it's not a great product, but I was very, very happy with the single malt. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a cool, very small production Japanese, actually fully 100% Japanese whiskey. Um, and they actually even say how old the components are. Uh, not on the label, but if you do some digging, uh, they will outright say exactly the makeup of this whiskey, which I think is even cooler. Um, it does not say on here as well, non-chill filtered and non-colored, I forgot to mention that, and 46%, which is cool. Um, so it's very, you know, geek friendly. It's a, it's, it's an integrity malt, I guess. Um, and yeah, they, they give us the exact breakdown of the whiskeys. Um, now, they give us the exact breakdown in terms of, they say there's three different types of casks that they pull from the warehouse to make this blend. Um, so I say blend, for those of you who aren't aware, most single malts are blends. It just means they're blends of casks from one distillery. That's the single. So it's not just a single cask. They they still have several casks blended together to make this product. Uh, and the cask that they use for this is a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and a four-year-old. And they don't outright say it, but I'm, it's assumed that the seven-year-old is um, Spanish oak uh, ex sherry. The five-year-old is a virgin American oak, and the four-year-old is ex bourbon. Like they, I say they don't outright say it. They don't outright say which one is which. So that we know there's a seven, five, and a four, and we know there's a Spanish ex sherry, a uh, virgin, and an ex bourbon. We're not entirely certain which one matches with which, but it's implied that they're in that same order. Um, so yeah, Spanish oak ex sherry, most likely seven years old. Virgin American oak, most likely five, and ex bourbon, most likely four. I think that's great, especially if you take into account that this is one of those distilleries where the climate is very, very different to. Scotland. This is not quite on the Amroot level that we talked about in the previous episode, um, but they lose a lot more to the Angel share than they do in Scotland, and it's implied that the maturation is somewhat increased by that um, bigger difference in temperature between day and night and between the seasons, and the different air pressure and, you know, humidity and all those things come into play. Uh, so yeah, Slancher. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's just, it smells almost like a rusty nail. And I, I, don't, I don't mean an actual rusty nail this time. I mean the cocktail, like uh, Drambuie, those really big honey herbs uh, with the whiskey. It smells like a really whiskey heavy rusty nail cocktail, which is the most Scottish of all cocktails, equal parts Drambuie and whiskey. Um, there's a lot of Scottish cocktails, which are just two things poured together in equal measures. I think it's brilliant. I, 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 I love it to bits. Um, another one of my favorites, of course, is a whiskey Mac, um, which is the, the, the green, um, the green ginger wine with equal parts with whiskey. Brilliant. Such an easy, ridiculous cocktail. Um, anyway, you know, speaking of ginger, there is a bit of ginger on the nose here as well. Ah. <sighs> Mm. It's just a really nice honeyed spice, clean whiskey. It's apples, it's pears, it's orchard fruits. It's not unlike the Longmorn, to be honest. It's quite similar. In fact, a, a quick side by side of these two. Yeah, not too dissimilar at all. It's very, very much the same. The, the same sort of palette of colors play uh, play in these. I 
I'd say the white oak is a little bit more summery, a little lighter, you know? And you can see, I mean, I'm not one for looking at the legs. I think they're mostly useless, but that is quite the legs this is leaving. It's quite viscous still. So that lack of chill filtration certainly goes into play there. This is a very satisfying whiskey. And it's a whiskey which, as I said, when I first opened it and when we first reviewed it, I didn't give it as much credit as I give it now after sitting with it. This is oxidized, you know, my bottle, I don't know if you can really see, is about half full now. So it's been, been open for about a year and a half. It's been oxidizing for a while. It's really opened up quite nicely. This is a spectacular whiskey. Um, well, okay. Um, I, I, I shouldn't go overboard. It's not a spectacular whiskey. This is not a whiskey that is ever going to, like, completely blow your mind. But in comparison to my original opinions on this whiskey, it's seemingly spectacular in comparison to that. I think this is a very, very solid whiskey. Um, and as much as I brought it in in the first place because I thought it had a really good story and I thought the value was pretty good, especially for Japanese whiskey, um, I now... I rate it really quite highly for for its quality and its individuality now as well. And this this is definitely a whiskey I'm proud to have on our shelves. Uh, this, of course, with with anything I'm uh, I'm doing in this video today is going to be on special. Uh, this was originally one seventy two oh nine. Uh, bearing in mind that this is a five hundred ml bottle, not a full size, so it's three quarter size bottle. Sorry, two third size bottle. Um, and it's now one fifty two oh nine, so one hundred and fifty two dollars and nine cents for an, you know, bona fide single malt Japanese whiskey. Um, single malt Japanese whiskey at that price is pretty unheard of, especially as we know the exact breakdown as well. We know this is between four and seven years old, which is good to know as well because I. Th Correct me if I'm wrong, I think Japanese whiskey is actually allowed to be called whiskey at two. So there's a lot of Japanese whiskey non HDM out there that can be very, very young. Um, this is good quality stuff. I'm I'm really, really happy with this whiskey. Hmm. Okay, so whiskey number two. Whiskey number two is the Yamazakura Pure Malt Whiskey. So this is where we start talking more about what makes Japanese whiskey Japanese and the so-called fake Japanese whiskies. Because this is not a single malt, but rather a pure malt. And this has quite the story to it. In fact, nothing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say right now on camera is going to quite do it justice compared to the write-up that I made when we had this in the Dram Association, which is actually the... Uh, the the most uh, the, the most seen page on the Dram Association website. Uh, apparently, people have been searching for answers about the Yamazakura, and uh, apparently, our website has been trying to provide some answers for them. So, I'm actually going to pick up my tablet right now and read direct from my tasting notes from about two years ago because I think they're going to be better than anything I can put together verbally right now. So, one second. Okay, so, to the Dram Association website, Doo -doo -doo. there we go, Dram Association website, so this was E33, so we had this quite a while ago now, um, August 26, 2018, so about a year and a half, coming up to two years, and we called this a sweet peat treat for a spacewalk, and that's an interesting thing as well, because at the, at the end of the day, when all said and done, um, the the scorecards that members give to give our, our average reviews, um, they did not score this as a peated whiskey. They decided uh, overwhelmingly that this was a fragrant and floral whiskey. So whereas on my initial tastings, when I first opened the bottle, I was getting not a big hit of peat. It was quite light, but it was certainly um, present. Um, apparently not so much for, for most of the people. So what did I say here? Ooh, this is fairly long. Stick with me, guys. So, fitting in with this month's Japanese masterclass, um, August's second dram this year is an exciting new arrival for Japan, uh, from Japan. Uh, but what on earth is it? It's not entirely clear, so let's do some sleuthing. First, let's take a look at the clues. The packaging. Well, it's definitely Japanese, even at first glance. Matte blue with a mon, uh, the Japanese coat of arms, stamped on the top, as you can see there. It's kind of cool. Um, 
The, the mon seems to be a five-point stylized design, usually resembling sakura, cherry blossoms. This implies a strong heritage and family lineage. And in fact, the bottom of the front side proudly states, since 1975. Where is it? Yeah, since 1975. Um, pretty cool. So we know that whoever produced this whiskey has a pretty long history, and the name certainly fits. Yamazakura Pure Malt Whiskey couldn't possibly sound more Japanese. Yamazakura literally translates to Mountain Blossom, and the front is adorned with a pattern depicting these two icons. Uh, the company's name, Sasanokawa Shuzo Company Limited Japan. Luckily, we have a block of text right on the front of the box, which I, I don't have the box anymore, unfortunately, uh, which goes into more detail. Confirming that the company was founded in 1765, it then goes on to tell us that they got a license to produce whiskey in 1946. Whether this is actually when they started making whiskey or not, we don't know. Akashi, of course, waited around 40 or more years um, after being granted the first license. Uh, lacking this detail may or may not be a deliberate choice, although instead the box give us, gives us a rather seemingly random information on who the Director General of the Tax Bureau was at the time. Yeah. Um, I have no idea the relevance to this, but in case anyone is interested, it was Hayato Ikeda. Uh, this is definitely a product made for the Japanese market, so it's possible we're missing out on some Japanese in-joke or something here. If anyone can tell me the significance of this, there is a handsome reward in it for you. Um, they are in the Tohoku region in the northeast of Japan's Honshu Island, known for its volcanoes and skiing, and tragically for being the epicenter of the 2011 earthquake. So just on that... Uh, on that note there of the Director General of the Tax Bureau, uh, we actually did get a comment in here from a regular member who may or may not be watching these videos, Mike Dobinson. So Mike, if you're watching, great to see you. Thank you for your input. I'm gonna let people know what you found out. Um, so uh, Mike did some further digging, found out that uh, the Director General of the Tax Bureau, um, uh, Hiato Ikeda, was actually a childhood friend of Masataka Takatsuru. So they were basically name dropping him, it's thought, uh, so that uh, it would give their whiskey the same kind of notoriety that Nico had at the time, which, sure, I don't know how many people know that they were close friends and if that's actually gonna work, but that's pretty cool. Um, I promised Mike a, a handsome reward. And honestly, I can't remember if I actually gave you anything, Mike. So if you're watching this video and you're going, yeah, you did promise me a reward and you never gave me anything, you bastard. Uh, let me know and I will drop something off to you. So sorry about that. Um, okay, where do we get to? Uh, so, then in slightly broken English, the writing starts to describe the whiskey. It sounds at first perhaps overly insistent at its pure malt status, telling us not once but twice that it's made from 100% unblended malt whiskey, which is in itself an odd statement. For if it were 100% unblended, it would mean it's a single cask release. Um, why then would they call it a pure malt and not the internationally protected single malt? If you read carefully though, it isn't saying that the whiskey itself is unblended, but the ingredients are which is pretty curious. Um, this isn't a distinction that we're used to seeing for blended malts, and I'm not entirely sure if it's particularly important. Um, so I consulted The Way of Whiskey, which I, I still have in the next room, which is a fantastic book on Japanese whiskey by the, uh, the great Japanese whiskey author, uh, Dave Broom. I say Japanese whiskey author. Author on Japanese whiskey. Dave Broom is not Japanese, as you can probably tell from the name. Um, uh, Dave Broom is a fantastic author of whiskey in general, I should say, as well. His other books are excellent, especially The Atlas. Um, so after reading reading into it, uh, Sasanakawa were in fact a major player in Japanese whiskey in North Honshu throughout the mid-20th century, strong enough apparently to rival even Nika and Suntory. Uh, they didn't waste any time in becoming licensed and were distilling whiskey in that same year. So that answers that question. Uh, why then did we did the West not hear about this supposed third pillar of Japanese whiskey? Well, sales started to decline alongside all Japanese whiskey towards the end of the 80s, and although Sasanokawa kept going, their profile never uh, fully recovered. When Japanese whiskey was just hitting the global market and becoming the revered elixir it is today, disaster struck for Sasanokawa. Remember how I mentioned the uh, Tohoku um, earthquake in 2011? Well, it got worse. Sasanokawa is located in Koryama, which is less than 40 miles from Fukushima Danai, uh, Dainai nuclear power plant, which you've probably heard of and not for a good reason. The damage was substantial, not only to infrastructure, but also to the whiskey stocks, which almost all of which were lost. Luckily, Sasanakawa has been around for a long time and they made some great business friends along the way. They're classified as a G whiskey, a local whiskey, 
Um, and this means that they could take advantage of now the possibly overly abused law, uh, which means you can add foreign spirit to the blend and still call it Japanese. Many newer distilleries abuse this by buying cheap blended whiskey in bulk from nearby India, and as you can imagine, the results can be terrible. Sasanakawa, however, have a long-standing reputation to uphold. So imagine, so remember that weird phrase on the box made with 100% unblended whiskey? This is where this comes in. It's saying that the imported part of the whiskey is not just pre-made bulk crap from whoever, who knows where, but only single casks from reputable distilleries and blended on site with an eye to quality. In this case, single casks of malt whiskey reportedly mostly from Scotland. Um, uh, even their blended whiskey, which I'm admittedly not a fan of, uses high quality Canadian grain whiskey, I believe, from uh, Alberta Distillers, which is kind of cool. Uh, now, folk who came to the Japanese master class that month will remember how Japanese distilleries rarely blend their whiskies together with spirit uh, with each other. Um, my theory on this is that it's ingrained in Japanese culture that is honourable to responsible for one's own, own success. However, Japanese people will of course help each other out when needed, but to boast about doing so would be naturally dishonourable. That being said, if you dig deep enough, or just read Dave's Broom's book, you will discover that Sasanakawa helped a fellow whiskey legend just 11 years before their own tragedy. When the highly acclaimed Hanyu distillery closed down, it was Sasanakawa that helped Ichiro Akuro buy his granddad's whiskey stocks, and then became the legendary and very expensive Ichiro's Malt Series, which helped Ichiro to rebuild his family dream and launch the incredibly successful Chichibu distillery. Tasting this whiskey is like a choose-your-own-adventure. It's completely unknown what casks go into the Yamazakura Pure Malt, so the story is yours to discover. I can't tell you anything for certain, except there is at least some Japanese whiskey, assumedly from Sasanakawa's own distillery. However, if I was a betting man, I'd say that there's some high-quality sherried malt from Scotland. Probably something like Longmorn, which has strong ties to Japanese whiskey. I would also say that there's a strong chance that there's something from Hanyu, from Sasanakawa's own stocks, and in a karmic debt from repayment from Ichiro. I would say that there might even be some Chichibu in there. The PT flavour that I found has to be from somewhere, and my imagination likes that answer best, so I'm gonna go with it. What stories will the flavour tell you? Well, if you have a bottle of this, let me know what you think might be in it, because honestly, it's anyone's guess at this point. I'm gonna prop this back and uh, pour myself a dram. Alrighty. Do -do -do. Alrighty, sorry about that. If only I had a second tablet, that would that would work well. Unfortunately, my memory is not very good, so I actually have the tablet propped up next to the camera with all of the dates and prices and things that I would not necessarily remember otherwise. Mm, how the sausage is made, right? So, Yamazakura Pure Malt. I have to admit, I hate the cork on this. I, I love the, the wooden top and the mon on there. I really just, it's, it's one of those fake corks. It looks like cork, but it's been covered in a thick layer of plastic, so it didn't really act like cork. Um, yeah, details, right? Relatively irrelevant. I'm not entirely taken on the bottle as I need that to be brutally honest, but at the end of the day, the whiskey inside is what matters most. No, I still get that distant hint of peat on there. It's 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 still it's still there. Today I'm getting a lot of cherry wood. Um, a little bit of like a plum thing going on, and almonds. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, there's definitely, it's not big on the smoke, it's not big on the peat, but there's definitely something, the, 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 the memories of peat are, are in there. There's just, a, I think, just a little, little bit of peated whiskey in here, not heavily peated, but really brings it all together. It gives it this nice savoury, uh, savoury note that then lets all the, the various uh, more floral and fruity flavours come out. And it's definitely fruity, it's definitely floral, but it's very... Um, balanced. It's it's almost perfectly balanced. There's, I can't find a sharp edge to this whiskey at all. There's not 
there's not a single note that seems out of place. Everything is perfectly folded and just exactly set where it should be. Again, just like the Akashi, I'm getting a lot of apples and pears on this one. Hmm. Yeah, there is. For all of the people out there that I've seen some people post reviews on this on places like Reddit uh, and other places on the internet, and always there's some asshole that goes straight into the comments of, it's fake Japanese whiskey. Uh, dude, uh, go away. I don't, I don't care. Like, Japanese whiskey, by definition, like the actual definition of Japanese whiskey allows you to use other whiskey. So long as that other whiskey is high quality and presented in the right way, that is Japanese whiskey. That, like, by definition, that is Japanese whiskey. Just because it's not your definition of Japanese whiskey doesn't mean you can go around calling things like Yamazakura fake Japanese whiskey. This is Japanese whiskey. Like, there's no denying that if you have a brain cell. This is actual Japanese whiskey. Uh, and it's presented incredibly well. 48% um, the, the malt that they brought in is obviously a very, very high quality. Like, if I was tasting this blind in a scotch lineup, I wouldn't be disappointed. I'd be very happy. I, as much as this Long Morning 18 is obviously very inexpensive, and it should be a lot more expensive, like, I would assume this, on an, in a normal circumstance where this isn't a ill-gotten airport exclusive. I would say this Long Norton 18 should realistically be around the 200 250 dollar mark. Maybe more. I mean, in BC, Canada, that's the kind of prices we're looking at for this kind of thing. Um, this, no offense to the Long Morn, this Long Morn is absolutely great. This is better. This is absolutely better. So despite the fact that you're paying, you know, the, the extra money for the fact that it's Japanese and all of the all of the parts that come with that, which is not just, it's not just that they're over-hyping and overpricing Japanese whiskey. The economy is a completely different ball game to, uh, to Scotland, of course, and the economy of scale as well. They're not exporting as much whiskey as Scotland is. They're not set up for it. They're not making as much and they're not making enough. So like as much as people will cry from the rooftops that Japanese whiskey is overpriced, yeah, it's more expensive. That doesn't necessarily mean overpriced. Uh, some of it, don't get me wrong, absolutely is. Have you seen the price of some of the shit the British put out at the uh, at the government liquor stores on the Nika release? Holy crap. Um, but some of it is also very reasonable for, for what it is. You just have to take into account that different countries have different tax structures and different imports and export duties and all, all of that. And I think the Japanese whiskey like this, I think is pretty pretty damn reasonable. I do wish we knew more details. I wish we knew where it was from. I wish we knew the age. I wish we knew the cask types. But taking it purely on its own merit, purely by its spirit, purely by drinking it, I am very, very happy with the Yamazakura Pure Malt. Um, both of these whiskies, I think, are ones that you definitely should try before you buy if you have the opportunity. Obviously, right now, it's pretty difficult. But if you trust me and you take my word for it, Pick up a bottle. Um, I will be surprised if you end up being disappointed by either of these, to be honest. I think these are both fantastic whiskies. And I'm, yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the third whiskey is all about. Before I move on to it, I should tell you the price of the Yamazakura. Uh, again, with the Akashi, we're reinstating the original Dram Association special pricing on it. So normally, $223.39. It is now uh, $194.70. $194.70 for this really unique, enigmatic Japanese whiskey, which no matter what people on the internet will tell you, I will argue is absolutely Japanese whiskey. Absolutely. Hmm. Right, let's get this one out of the way. I'll make some room on the table for number three. So, third whiskey today, one I have never had before, but I've had its little brother, I guess. Uh, this is one which has an absolutely bizarre story behind it, but is being 
very, very highly regarded around the world. So, I got myself a glass, I'm gonna grab the bottle, and I'm gonna say, welcome to the Dram Association, Cask Strength Kayo Whiskey, Japanese Mizunara Oak, unchill filtered, 53% by volume, 750 ml bottle. That is literally everything it says on the front label. I don't know why I read the whole thing. I'm just very excited to try this. This is going to be very cool. So, as I said before, Japanese whiskey is not all about being made in Japan. A lot of it is about both blending and maturation techniques. And, ooh, come on. One big thing about maturation, of course, Japanese oak, Mizunara casks, a very large part of Japanese whiskey distilling history. They like the wooden the wooden tops, don't they, in Japan? Ooh. So. Let's see how that goes. All right, so. It doesn't really give us more information on the back of the bottle. Uh, it just says, you know, standard government warnings. Um, sole U.S. importer, Park Street Import. So obviously this came via the U.S., uh, produced by Kayo um, in the Edo Bori Center building in Nishiku, Osaka, Japan. Huh, that's interesting. So. Hmm. I need that to open up for a second. First thing on the nose though, banana bread. Always a good one. Um, so these guys are pretty new on the scene and very interestingly, they are, at the moment, only available outside of Japan. Um, they, they, I know they're launching in Japan, I believe, at some point this year. I'm sure the outbreak has probably, you know, put that off a little bit if they uh, didn't manage to squeak it in in January or February. Um, but yes, I, am, I, I believe they are, they are coming to Japan soon. Um, but very interesting, secretive company. Uh, the whiskey itself launched in 2018, uh, but the company has been going for about a decade before then. So the ownership is relatively unclear. However, um, some deep digging on the internet, which was done by someone else, not me, because as much as I can do a bit of research, I can't go this deep. If you look at the Panama Papers, yep, yeah, if you look at the Panama Papers, um, you will can find out this is owned by an international group of investors, including apparently some of the world's richest people. So there's a lot of money behind Kayo, apparently. Um, I'm not gonna hold it against the whiskey. Um, I have nothing personally against billionaires. I wish there were less of them. But uh, yeah, it's a really interesting, hmm, something up nicely, really interesting, um, mysterious ownership. Apparently somewhere in there, um, uh, the uh, Hennessy guys were involved, but not they didn't want to put their name on it. Um, so it's not actually owned by Moet Hennessy. It's not under the same um, Ardbeg Glenmorangie ownership. I think they have a stake in it, but they didn't want to be involved in the distribution. There's something fishy going on, but I don't know. If it results in good whiskey, um, then, you know, obviously if I find out that this is the, you know, money from slave labor or something, then I will pour it all down the drain and I will hate myself forever touting it. But I I think the mysterious aspect of where it's from is kind of neat. I, I feel like I'm drinking mafia whiskey right now. Well, I'm not drinking, but smelling mafia whiskey right now. Um, weirdly enough, the, the name Kayo, although it actually has an address in Japan now, in Osaka, which might be just for, just, just for um, visuals, to be honest. Um, the, it's not actually uh, been trademarked in Japan yet. Um, apparently, I think the only place it's been trademarked is New Zealand, of all places. Um, one thing we do know, though, is they actually have someone who knows their shit working for them. Their, their master blender is a guy called Jeff Karlovich. Hmm. And Jeff Karlovich is, or Karlovich, Kar I don't know. Um, if, if anyone knows how to spell that, uh, how to pronounce Karlovich or Karlovich, it's one of the two, I'm sure. Actually, I'm not sure. It could be anything. It could be Karlovich. Uh, I'm not sure. Anyway, Jeff. Let's go with Jeff. Um, Jeff uh, is formerly of some very well-known distilleries. He formerly worked for Budahaven, Tobermory, and Deanston. Uh, so he's got quite the pedigree. He moved on from there to go work for the... Um, um, Oh, I can't remember what they're called now. There was a, there was a company that made um, 
uh, that tried to recreate closed distilleries. Lost Distillery Company, I think, was the call of it, uh, the, the name of it. Uh, so they like had the Jericho edition and things where they'd use blended malts to try and approximate uh, from historical records what closed distilleries whiskies tasted like. And they actually, uh, Jeff himself, would actually taste samples from those closed distilleries and come up with approximations with uh, available spirit. That's pretty cool. Uh, he then went to Japan where he worked with... Uh, Egashima, uh, as well as Mars, uh, the, the guys that make the Martian Sioux whiskies, and Chichibu, as we mentioned in the Azakura, who are very, very popular these days. So he's got quite a lot of history with both Scotch and Japanese whiskey. Um, apparently, I don't know if Jeff was involved at the time, but the investors that uh, got in with Kayo, they saw the rise in Japanese whiskey, and they're the kind of people that knew what was going to happen. Uh, so they wanted to get in early. So about a decade ago, um, they wanted to get right in there. And even then, they were finding it really hard to get uh, to buy casks of Japanese whiskey, like mature Japanese whiskey. Were, it wasn't produced in large amounts a decade ago. And even though it wasn't as popular at all as it is now, it was, you know, still fairly popular, especially domestically. Um, and they just didn't have enough to be able to sell. So what they did is they thought ahead and went, okay, well, if we can't do it now, we'll do it later. We've got the money. Let's buy a metric shit ton of Japanese new make and mature it ourselves. And that's what they did. Um, they And they waited. They waited a decent amount of time. They matured it in uh, in a mixture of casks, but every single one of them has some time in the Mizunara casks. Mizunara, of course, the native Japanese oak, takes about 200 years for the tree to mature enough to be made into casks. Uh, as a result, it is about 10 times the cost of a regular cask. It is incredibly expensive to buy a Mizunara cask. Um, they are also prone to leakage. Uh, these guys lose about, um, I, th I think uh, I think they said like about a tenth of the cask to leakage, which is insane. Uh, sometimes they lose entire casks, um, which we'll get to in a second. Um, but yeah, they, they, the Mizunara oak, incredibly expensive. They actually uh, make the walls of the cask twice as thick as they do with European or American oak just to try and uh, reduce the amount of leakage, which is nuts. Um, so they put it in Mizunara casks, but there's one more thing as well. So Kayo um, actually translates to ocean, apparently, in Japanese. Um, it's not something I remember from my history, uh, from my history, from my uh, from my Japanese lessons back in uh, high school. Um, but it's something that I I read on the internet, and there was little things that you read on the internet, take with a grain of salt. But apparently, Kayo means ocean. Um, and the reason for that is because not only is it matured in these cool Mizunara casks, but they put those Mizunara casks on a boat, and they mature the whiskey on the ocean. Much like, as you've probably come across before, Jefferson's Ocean, which does exactly the same thing with bourbon, which is kind of cool. Uh, that's pretty neat. And it also means that out of these three whiskies, although this is apparently 100% distilled in Japan, um, it's a teaspoon whiskey. They won't say what distillery allowed them to buy so much new make back in the day. Um, they are not allowed to call this Japanese whiskey. Because despite the fact that you're allowed to put quite a bit of uh, non-Japanese whiskey into a Japanese whiskey um, and call it Japanese whiskey, they draw the line at maturing your whiskey outside of Japan. So because this went into international waters, although it was distilled 100% in Japan, it is not Japanese whiskey. So it's kind of the opposite of the Yamazakura in a sense. Kind of, uh, kind of bizarre, but... Scotland has exactly the same rule as we found in the Nomad a couple of videos ago as well. So it kind of makes sense as a historical precedent set on that. I think I've talked long enough that this has opened up a little bit now, so let's hit it. Chai spice on the nose. So as I said, banana bread when, it first opened, when I first smelt it. Still kind of there. A lot of chai tea, like black tea and those chai spices. Custard. Big, big, rich, creamy custard. Vanilla as well. It's got that classic Japanese sort of vanilla ice cream, vanilla custard thing going, which Mizunara Oak is particularly um, particularly uh, prone to those flavors. Mm. One thing I should mention as well, this is apparently the cask strength version of their regular The Single. And 
that is interesting because the single has an age statement. The single is apparently seven years old. It says right on the bottle. We actually have that in the strap right now as well. Um, this doesn't have an age statement, but we can extrapolate that it's probably a similar age. It's probably a year, year, maybe, maybe two younger, but it's probably six, I would guess, maybe seven still. Um, so it's not one of these two-year-old Japanese whiskies that you might end up with. Certainly doesn't look and smell young. Overly young, that is. Doesn't smell like a 20 year old. There's a little bit of a sawdust, but not, not in like a, a virgin oak, like not in like a young raw bourbon kind of way, but in a, in sort of a, a slight hint of it, like a, 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 just a dusty, woody thing going on. A lot of orange rind. A lot of licorice on the nose as well. Ooh, that is big and beautiful. Oh my. I'm glad I got a bottle of this. I think it means there's only five left though, so. That. Ooh. That has that beautiful slight um sorry my nose is itching like crazy hell i'm doing it again thank you sharing him again keeping us safe whoa oh i don't know why my nose is itching so much i think it just had a got overpowered by the the strength not the, the alcohol strength but the strength of flavor on this 53 percent by the way if you if, uh, if i didn't mention that before i think i did it's got a yeah it's got a funny Yeah, I'm not going mad. It's not on the nose. Absolutely there on the palate. It's got this Palmer Violet thing going on. That violet -y lavender. The same thing that I found uh, and I find quite often in Beaumont. But without the peat whatsoever. There's no peat in this. Kayo does do a peated edition, uh, which we actually have. <laughs> this is the sad thing. We were about to launch the Kayo peated edition at our 1621 Whiskey Hours bar Um which of course has been shut down to, due to the uh, outbreak. But I can promise you, when all this is said and done, 1621, we will have our grand reopening whiskey party at some point soon after the Sticky Wicket opens again, and we will have the Kayo Petit available to sample there. Yeah. Oh, it's cool. It's, it's got... It's got all of those licorice, like, tiger tail ice cream thing. Licorice and orange, but with that soft floral parma violet lavender thing going on there. Oh, that is utterly unique. As much as these two are very Japanese in the sense that they're very well-crafted and well-blended, this is very Japanese in the sense that it has that just classic... Japanese Mizunara cask influence. This is just big and bold, but it does something that I've not had before in the Mizunara cask. It does that funny orangey floral thing going on there. And I have to say, as much as I was very excited to try these two again on camera, because I haven't opened, I haven't poured myself a glass of either of these whiskeys in probably three or four months. It's been a while since I've had a, had a Yamazaka or an Akashi. This is my favorite of the three. That's hard to admit because, you know, I love these two whiskeys and honestly we have a fairly decent amount of stock of both of them so it'd be good to sell a few but I can't, I can't be caught lying on camera. This, which we only actually have I think five of. This is really bloody good. Dark chocolate chips as well. But yeah, that, mm, that crazy lavender licorice orange triple threat there. It's like an ice cream flavor that I never knew existed that I just want pints of right now. Tiger tail with a hint of lavender. Just gorgeous. 
I am very, very, very impressed with this whiskey. I think this is very, very much a step up from the seven-year-old, which is the only Cayo I've actually had so far. I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do with peated malt. Um, so yeah, come come back and join me for 1621 for that. But yeah, I think this is a very, very solid whiskey. I really, really hope it doesn't come out that these guys are using slave labor or something, or, you know, they're the most evil men on the planet who are behind this. Um, but whilst we live in uh, blissful ignorance, I am very happy to drink more of this whiskey. Mm. Okay, I should hit the uh, the big red launch button. So, when my finger hits the table, this whiskey will officially be launched at Strathlicker.com. The normal price, which I don't I don't know that we'll have any left at the normal price, is one eighty two fifty two. You can get it right now for I'm gonna say at least two weeks. We'll keep the special going. One hundred and sixty dollars and seventy eight cents now. $160. I'm, excuse me. I'm so excited. I'm sneezing about it. $160.78 available right now. Um, please uh, pick one up if it sounds like something you'd be interested in. And uh, yeah, if not, we have hundreds of other options at strathaligger.com and I would be more than happy to deliver them to your door. Uh, on that note, if you're watching this at the... Um, at the premiere on Sunday night, um, I, I should mention that, yes, tomorrow is Easter Monday. No, that doesn't mean that I get the day off. Yes, that does mean I will be delivering. So if you want anything delivered to your door between 1 p.m. and 5 p.m., I'm your man. Uh, let me know. Uh, just uh, go straight to strathlicker.com, place an order, and I will have it at your door if you live in Victoria. And, uh, yeah, slant your bar. Or, I guess, more accurately... Can pie. See you next time. Oh, next time, I should tell you. Next time, we're doing something very different. Next time, I'm not even going to be talking about whiskey. Ladies and gentlemen, we're stepping out of our comfort zone once again. Um, join us on Friday night at the the new uh, member-approved time of 7.30. I got my, my, my hand slapped for saying 7 o'clock because, of course, people want to go out and uh, make a big noise for all of the doctors and nurses and support workers out there, which is admirable. And I'm going to, I'm encouraged to join you on that. So uh, we'll no longer be doing at seven o'clock. We're doing 7.30 from now on because of that. I will see you at 7.30 on Friday night as we explore gin. Local, support local, craft gin. So I'm going to be having, I don't know how many, four, five, six. We'll see how many I can fit on the table. I'm going to have a bunch of different local craft gins, and uh, I look forward to uh, showcasing them all. I know for a fact we're going to have some Sherringham, um, and I'm sure we'll have Shelter Point. We're going to have some Divine Gin, probably. We'll see what we can bring out, and uh, we'll talk about local gins. And I'll see you there. Slanchevar, Kampai, stay safe. Love you all. <laughs>